these jungle fighters, veterans of the Seven-Year-Old War, are facing a new red threat. An air bridge over the jungle is the only way to supply the troops with the food and ammunition needed to blunt and turn back the savage thrust of the communist Viet Minh forces against the Laotian capital of Luang Prabang. Like Vietnam, Laos was also divided respectively with the Chinese to the north and the British to the south. Both Vietnam and Laos were therefore subjected to the same rules and statuses as one or the other. Simultaneously invading Vietnamese land, the Chinese forces began their downward vertical insertion to the southwest of Laotian land, since it was, after all, part of Indochina territory. On September 22, 1945, Chinese troops entered Luang Prabang, Sa Kek, Savan Kek, and the capital Vian Tiane in the following days. Following their occupation, the KMT Chinese disarmed the French in Viente, but lead the Prince Fes. Sar Festarath Fes- as the head of government, just, lo- just like what the Japanese and what the South Vietnamese tried to do. However, it was not the same as the power went in favor of such viceroy. The prince's plan was to halt the colonial movement while controlling the colonial bureaucracy. In a crazy turn of events on September 9th, 1945, three French forces attempted to take the city of S- Savannah Ket in central Laos which was not controlled by the Chinese at the time, but were repulsed by the Lao Isara, which is the army of Laos, which was assisted by the Viet Minh. Ho Chi Minh later would make communications with Fet Sarath on this insurgency against the French. The Franco-British force went even further months before to Pulua Prabang in August 25th and to the capital, Vientiane, on September 3rd, 1945. Headed by the French commando, Colonel Hans Infield, who sought the gradual independence for Laotians. However, the Laotians remained skeptical after hearing de Gaulle's real intentions. But what was funny was the Japanese force was still around at the time, and that pushed the French to reconsider creating a puppet, I mean protectorate state, but they were about to surrender anyway. The Japanese, I mean. However, since this was before World War II's end, and it was seized by a small band of commandos, this explains why the Chinese weren't provoked, because they didn't confirm to go yet. And despite French requests for a protectorate, both times they were denied by Fetzerat before the war's end and when the Chinese were occupying it on October 4th, 1945. Fetzerat would make diplomacy between the Thai, Cambodian, and Vietnamese resistance groups along with the Lao Isara. Again, why was the Chinese occupation on North Indochina important to Laos? Because on October 7th, 1945, the occupation allowed Ho and the Viet Minh to fly Prince Sup Phan Nu Vong, the Red, Brin- the Red Prince, through the cities in Laos to start his liberation and defense army and create a committee of independent Laos with Sup Phan Nu Vong and Phet Sarath in charge. But that's not the fun part. November 4th, despite Chinese military presence, good job Kumitong, local officials in La- uh, Lao Isara seized control of royal establishments and forced central control from La- Laoang Prabang to Vientiane capital of the day. Royal family members such as Prince Savan yeah, were deposed, causing loss of face in relations and long-lasting effects in the decades to come. Like the Vietnamese, the Laos populace viewed the Chinese as pests with much distaste, but was a necessary force to catalyze the ends. A pest, but a buffer against the French momentum. Many accounts described the Chinese soldiers as a swarm of locusts as they arrived into the north. Ho Chi Minh initially cooperated with the Chinese who unceremoniously evicted the French from the governor general's palace. American advisors accompanied the Chinese but were ordered not to become involved in French-Chinese relations or in any way become associated with either side in possible conflicts. September 27th, 1945, in a meeting with U.S. Army officers General Gallagher and Major Patty, Ho Chi Minh expressed fear that the Allies considered Indochina a conquered country and that the Chinese came as conquerors. Gallagher and Patty attempted to reassure him and urged continued negotiations with the French. In Hanoi, the Chinese soldiers consisting of poor conscripted peasants looted the hell out of the place. Locals, probably guess, did not enjoy the visit. Sometimes Ho Chi Minh would bribe KMT political and military officials with opium, money, and power and dissolve this communist party 
but kept it alive in secret while offering rival nationalist factions such as the once pro Japanese Dong Min Hoi and the VNQDD positions of leadership under him. But he did not need to do it for long. Although first hand accounts were rare to find, there was a general consensus and attitude from the Tonkinese of the incoming Chinese troops crossing the border of Yunnan. That attitude demonstrated the local population's distaste for the Chinese troops who entered the Red River Delta with tattered clothing, weight loss, and disorganization. Crowds of VNQDD and Vietnamese Revolutionary Leagues would flock to them like they were saviors to much of the disgust of the rest of the heavily populated Red River Delta. Chinese soldiers would quarter houses, demand rice from farmers, and pay them with alien currency with questionable value. Stories circulated that a cloud of flies followed the mass columns of Chinese soldiers marching down the roads. Talk about lower the block. While some struggled walking with their limbs degenerated by beriberi, which is a lack of vitamin B and not eating a lot of grain or dairy. It's pretty horrifying. By the end of 1945, the troop size peaked around the 100,000, accompanied by 20,000 porters since they barely had any vehicles, so they had to do it the General Von Little Vorbeck style, including camp followers and petty merchants. Now you gotta think about the size of that in an occupation of half a country the size of France. In comparison to the Franco-British troops, which numbered 35,000 men, including leftover Japanese soldiers gaining total control of Cochin China, it dwarfs the size of the Chinese. All over the Northern Territory, Chinese soldiers would seize granaries, barracks, warehouses, school buildings, government offices, and even some French civilian buildings. Entire platoons quartered upper-class Vietnamese residences. The Yunnan Railway, French vessels, motor vehicles, distilleries, and some printing presses were commandeered by Chinese soldiers. Stocks of cloth, coal, and salt were taken. Hanoi and Haiphong were where it occurred the most. Several episodes of altercations between the Viet populace and the Chinese military occurred in neighborhoods on Haiphong in the early days of the occupation. To add further heat to the tension, three days after Liu Han and Ho Chi Minh reached an understanding, an incident occurred where Chinese soldiers were provoked and ended up killing two and injuring ten civilians in the community. In response to the civil discontent with occupation forces, government intervention occurred against any talks that are not conductive to Sino-Vietnamese friendship. Newspapers were censored as well. All was not well, but the populations of Laotian and Vietnamese locals had turned the other cheek just for a little bit because the real war hasn't approached their doorstep just yet. Following the entry of troops into northern Indochina, General Liu Han, the commander, would soon arrive via plane directly to the Governor General's palace on September 14th, kicking out Jean Santanay, the commissioner there. He then summoned Ho Chi Minh to his palace where he declared him that one Chinese gold unit, Guanjin, is worth half Indo-Chinese piasters, which is like their currency, whatever. Overvaluing the Chinese currency, the Vietnamese feared that the Chinese would swoop the markets around and buy rice with these banknotes. General Liu Han, although he wanted to run the Chinese occupation north of the 16th parallel under Chinese military government, he would not follow the same British precedent that Jug General Douglas Gracie uh, had with martial law in Cochin China. General Liu Han is now testing Ho's assurances that the DRV would help maintain order in Hanoi as well as the countryside where the insurgents love to hang out and not antagonize the Chinese. This is where Ho put his trust to a foreign government to test. Two days following Liu Han's address to the lack of funds and payment to the Chinese occupation forces on September 16th, Ho announces to the Viet Minh to take action. And the Viet Minh, like the Vietnamese mafia they are, starts a fundraising campaign throughout Indochina. Tables are set up in public venues to receive donations of jewelry, gold leaf, and other precious items from patriotic citizens. This is what they called Gold Week, which ironically lasted for two weeks which ended with a grand ceremony with Emperor Bao Dai presiding over it. At Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh pledges to give to the highest donor a gold medal he has received from overseas Vietnamese admirers. To the crowd, Ho Chi Minh also presents Brigadier General Philip Gallagher, head of U.S. military advisory and assistance group attached to Liu Han's command, the next daily local papers feature about his participation. 
Although Gallagher had just arrived in Hanoi, one of his principal responsibilities was to coordinate the loadings of tens of thousands of Chinese troops on U.S. ships bound for Manchuria to fight the Reds as a turning point of the Chinese Civil War in China or Taiwan, the last bastion of Kuomintang existence. Overall, Go Week was just a cute little socialist reform to make amends meet to existing in such an awful situation. Nevertheless, this was one of the many events of the civil unrest that helped catalyze the outcome for the Vietnamese victory in 1979. Although the French have a presence in the south, they still had 4,500 colonial troops in the north imprisoned by Japanese soldiers at the Hanoi Citadel following direct orders from the Chinese military government. The French, in addition, have units in China finally freed from the Japanese occupiers in their own territory. In China, just sitting around. The question lies, can and how can we use the troops to our advantage to take the north and quell the already present violence coming from the insurgency of the Viet Minh in Southeast Asia? Paris pushed hard to get troops re-equipped and ready to allow the entry to the north, but this was opposed by General Liu Han and postponed by Chiang Kai-shek until the following year. Japanese units would confiscate French weapons and give them to the Viet Minh insurgents rather than the Chinese. In displaying more of tension among the three factions, in preparation for the September 28th surrender ceremony, the Chinese put the French at the bottom of their list of things to worry about. The French representative was guest 106 on the long list of guests at the ceremony. French flags were banned from the proceedings which caused French civilians to boycott the protest. Jesus, very patriotic. Meanwhile, remembering the days of the American Civil War, thousands of Chinese carpetbaggers were taking advantage of the Chinese occupation, reaping the benefits of power over a long-suffering people. Ethnic Chinese residents under the Vietnamese slash French nationality would link up with the government leaders for mutual gain. Overseas Chinese folk would drape Republic of China flags around their house instead of DRV flags, which at this point are seen as a puppet state to the international community. But it's actually a real nation acting out in secret. Shh. Adding on to the social political tensions, Chinese language newspapers in Haiphong and Hanoi condemned the French atrocities in Cochin, China, even to the point of proposing reprisals against the French nationals in the north. Meanwhile, Viet nationals are also locally and literally attacking French and Chinese nationals south and north respectively. It's a whole fucking mess. A holy trinity of nationalism. A cycle of animosity. But that is what human beings love to do. But as the sole leader of Viet spirit honors his word to General Liu Han, as well as his scheme to play chess pieces against another for his benefit, Ho prominently made sure that August 10th, 1911 anniversary of the Chinese Revolution was observed. In the morning of March 6th, 1946, a French armada of 35 ships and 21,000 men attempted to land at Haiphong in Tonkin. Their landing was prevented by Chinese soldiers occupying the harbor who exchanged fire with the French ships. Holy shit, there's literal war going on almost. And at that moment, the Chinese pressured both French and Vietnamese to sign an agreement. Back up in the north. Ho Chi Minh sought to form an agreement with KMT officials in control of Hanoi by destroying his Indo-Chinese Communist Party, although we all know it was operating in secret, and accepting the French's plea to bring French troops into the north instead of the Chinese, but not without Chinese and French separate agreement to give French concessions back to China so that Shang's forces leave the north of Indochina. On February 28th, 1946, the Treaty of Choking, which the French would cease their trade rights to China over Quang Chou Ch Quang Chou Wan territory was signed according to a table telegram that was sent from the British in Saigon but via London to the Australians in late December 1945 it stated the following advisor learns that the Chinese government are still assisting a via V French authorities that Chinese nationals should have the same rights in French Indochina as French nationals. The French are particularly anxious to withhold the right of ownership of land and are reporting that they are unable to agree with Chinese demand since it is not possible to lay down in advance future policy of the freedom of the French. Political advisor to the Allied Force Commander in Saigon reports that French authorities have been advised by the French ambassador at Chuking that General Lissimo Chiang Kai-shek has decided to withdraw Chinese forces in the near future, though the date has not been fixed from part of the French Indochina north of 16 degrees. So as early as December 1945, Chiang Kai-shek apparently made it known that he would put his troops out of Tonkin, but not to the international world. Ho signed the Ho Santanay 
agreement with French diplomat Jean Santenay on March 6, 1946, agreeing for a temporary free state and permitted the return of French colonial forces replacing the Chinese KMT who were supposed to be maintaining order there. France was to then continue stationing troops in North Vietnam until 1951, as well as adding Ho's territory to the Indochinese Federation as part of the French Union. At this point, the Chinese occupied the North for six months. That's half a damn year. The Chinese would not interfere with French reoccupation of in Northern Indochina because of the agreement Chiang Kai-shek and Charles de Gaulle have on February 1946, a month earlier, involving the exchange of concessions and territories. A reduction of French extraterritorial claims in China, so be known. This action then temporarily reunified Vietnam, albeit plus Laos and Cambodia, under French colonial rule. Again, as a result, the VNQDD were further attacked by the French, who encircled VNQDD strongholds, enabling them to be attacked by the Viet Minh. General Giap and his army hunted down the VNQDD troops and cleared them out of the Red River Delta, seizing arms and arresting party members who were falsely charged with crimes ranging from counterfeiting to unlawful arms possession. The Viet Viet Minh massacred thousands of VNQDD members and other Viet nationals in a large-scale purge. Most of the survivors fled to China, ironically how the Vichy French were escaping to China as well months earlier, or French-controlled areas in Vietnam. This is what happens when your daddy leaves you. On an interesting note, General Giap, the North Vietnamese Army, aka the NVA's most brilliant general, compared the March 6th Chokin Agreement to the Russian-German Brest-Litovsk Treaty of 1918. I mean, after all, it stopped two major powers from fighting each other. And it's a separate piece for a war that's about to start. The parties involved were interested in self-interest that might not be guaranteed in the long run. But it dramatically allowed a future we live in to be the way it is today. And the whole ordeal was important for a nation to transition from an imperial capitalistic to a communist regime. That's if you factor the whole Satane agreement with. However, in the light of the Quan Cho Chang return of Chinese ownership to the Chinese, Chiang Kai-shek's government told France to sign the agreement or else risk international war. Ooh, Mr. Big Guy here. Both the French and the Vietnamese fell into this Chinese trap, signing the treaty on terms they neither wanted. However, if the latter happened, in a crazy scenario of things, this would have happened. The thought of facing a war with China over this territory was unthinkable for General Jacques-Philippe Leclerc de Hautecloquet, or simply known as Leclerc. It would have been better to not lose troops for the ensuing war between the Vietnamese and the French. After all, the war was really between those two factions. China was only a stand-in, a third party, so to speak. Thus, China was the force that made both the reluctant to fight Ho, representing the Vietnamese, and the reluctant to fight Leclerc, representing the French, to sign a treaty to stop all hostilities, at least until the Chinese troops left North Vietnam. Because of this, the French occupied North Vietnam without much resistance. This diplomatic victory conceived Leclerc to send a force of 21,000 men to seize Haiphong and the surrounding areas immediately. At this point, Leclerc and the French said fuck you to Ho because they had no opposition that might cause international conflict, since the French expect the remaining Chinese to keep the occupation going before the French advance. If the Viet Minh start attacking Chinese troops, that would better convince the French to ally with China to defeat the enemy. So this was unthinkable for Ho. Once France had full rights to the Indochina territory, they would not mind bombing the hell out of Nam if any insurgency occurs. But also understanding that China might get caught in the crossfire and the unavoidable war between both the Viet Minh and the French, the Chinese made France sign a treaty with the Viet Minh first, also known as the DRV. Chinese officers then made sure that nothing was about to burst into a firefight in Hanoi as the Leclerc's battle-trained troops arrived in. If this all did not occur, the French had an unthinkable proposal to arm 3,000 troops unnoticed in the middle of Hanoi without the Chinese or the Vietnamese noticing, which is ridiculous because it would be impossible to happen anyway, especially while the Chinese and the Vietnamese actually knew something might happen in this hot political climate. For any of this to even occur, the French would need British Lord Mountbatten's Southeast Asia Command to prove any military action under him from the south of Indochina to the north. However, crossing into Shanks territory would cause trouble anyway. 